He's the man to do the damage. Oh! oh! The oh! As he oh! looks for another headshot! Oh! Let's talk about the Premier League. Uh, five Premier League points every week uh, that stood out for me. Here are the things that stood out for me uh, on the 13th of August. Uh, on Saturday, full Premier League programme uh, on that weekend. Lots to enjoy. So let's start by talking about Arsenal. One of the things that I said right at the get-go was they're not going to be legitimate title contenders. They're going to be title contenders in the sense that there will be a period of time where they have a run and everyone will go, are they title contenders? But they're going to pick up an injury or two. I think their squad's just a little bit brittle, a little bit flimsy, and they will fall off towards the inevitable end of the season. Uh, remember, we got a World Cup in the middle of a Premier League. This is going to have a huge impact on the league standings, and I'll talk more about that in a moment but the arsenal squad massively improved over the summer and let's just be real about it the way they performed against leicester absolutely verified everything uh, that i said about them that they are a very different beast leicester have problems i expect leicester to be in a relegation dogfight by the end of the season because let's be honest as well fucking you know brendan rogers is a fucking fraud he's not even on fraud watch he's just a fraud he's he's a known and established fraud but let's talk about the stats uh in that game it should tell you everything you need to know so it was a 4-2 game and at one point after arsenal had a ton of possession leicester city scored a goal it was via an own goal a silly own goal and you and we were like oh is it could they and then obviously arsenal went to like 3-1 with an almost immediate answer from Xhaka. Madison pegged one back, and then Martinelli got another again within almost a minute of uh, Leicester having, you know, looked like it was going to be a close game. But they split their possession 50-50 in that game between the two teams. But, you know, 19 shots were generated in that time by Arsenal. Gabriel Jesus led the fucking line like it's something he's done all of his career. The two big signings I talked about uh, well, Gabriel Jesus is the obvious one, but I, a few Man City fans messaged me, and I was talking a lot about how good Zinchenko was going to be, and how he is, like, a great bit of utility to have in Arsenal, but actually he was, like, criminally underrated over at City. I had a lot of City fans message me and said, actually, they were really sad to see him go, uh, al almost more than Jesus to a degree, because they felt like Jesus was, like, one of those, they've got replaceable parts for him, but what Zinchenko offered was, like, something a little bit, like, unique and special. And I thought Zinchenko had a, you know, great start to his Arsenal career, was right up there. But this, you know... Look, when everything goes well for Arsenal, they have got, like, a really solid midfield. You know, you've got Zaka in there, the steel. If he can keep his temperament in place and not get any of those silly red cards, that's going to be good. Odegaard, captain now. You know, Saka, obviously, England international, proven quality. Martinelli got a goal, like, starting to look a bit less leggy and a bit more cultured. It, it was just a really good performance all round even though they conceded two goals which might be a concern if arsenal are gonna play this kind of attacking football they're gonna leak goals but it's not gonna matter because they're gonna blow opponents like leicester out the water all season i really feel good about my pick of third for arsenal i think they have got uh, just so much quality and you know look a lot of people have been talking about liverpool and saying liverpool are going to be really shaky this season many people are even saying liverpool aren't going to be top two this season i I don't think that after two games played i think that's a little bit crazy but you know if it was to happen then obviously it's arsenal that are going to be the beneficiaries of that quick word about leicester not that it fucking matters they are just dog unfortunately they are really going to struggle this season remember this is a leicester that can be as good as it, it you know as good as it can get now they're not going to sign any players they really are going to be over reliant on telemans and madison and forfana at the back they could lose any of those players at any moment uh, i feel sorry for ian Acho. seems to be doing a lot of like thank Thankless work up there, you know, beleaguered uh, essentially by himself. So, you know, look, Leicester are going to struggle. So you can't read too much into it from Arsenal. But I thought Arsenal were brilliant.
I really did. I'm very, very happy uh, with what Arsenal did. Are they title contenders? Probably not. But as I said, they'll be in that mix for a period of time, probably along with Spurs. Let's talk about Spurs. Spurs-Chelsea happened. And I got a lot of heat. Why are you underrating the Chelsea? Said the disgusting gammon fans. And I said, listen, I don't know what it is about them, but their squad should be better than what it delivers. Their preseason didn't impress me. They got wrecked by Arsenal. It wasn't even close. Tuchel was incandescent with rage over that result because they didn't even look like a team that should be playing the likes of Arsenal. It looked like a bottom half of the Prem team with that. And I feel that Chelsea, there's something about them. They should have the, one of the best defences in the league, but they seem susceptible. And I think we saw that against Spurs uh, again here because it was a two-all game. And it was a two-all game that they absolutely dominated and they should have been out of sight. Remember, Chelsea, they don't have a real quality striker at the moment. Obama Yang's meant to be coming in to fix that problem. But if you go and look at the stats for that game, it shouldn't even have been close. I watched that first half thinking to myself, like, oh my God, like, how could I have thought for a moment that this was going to be the team, Tottenham, that was going to be top three? Uh, it just didn't uh, feel like it at all. But actually, they, they've, they've now got four points from losing positions in games. And that's worth its weight in gold. Not a lot of people do that. Now, look, to give you the stats, which to why I think Chelsea are going to have real problems this season, if they cannot get a 30-goal a season striker in there, they had 64% possession. Now, keep in mind, it was 70% at half time, right? So they had 64% possession over a 90-minute game, 16 shots. How many on target? Three. And that is not enough. That is not enough for a team of Chelsea's uh, quality. It's not enough that their best player on the pitch was either Koulibaly, the new signing, or Kante. You're not going to score goals like that. There's not a lot of goals in the team. And even though they got to, and it looked like they were going to blow Tottenham out the water, they didn't for whatever reason. This game should have been out of sight before we even got to the fucking stage of talking about terrible refereeing decisions and meanwhile for spurs i thought spurs i don't know what they were lacking i really thought they were trying to spray the ball just a little bit too long there was players who i don't think are good enough to wear the shirt if they if that's how the, what they're gonna serve up they couldn't even get the ball to their strikers they have a devastating attack they weren't able to utilize it. Chelsea bossed the midfield, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you can't score goals. And they were able to get 2-2 in what was, by the way, probably, it's early, but the game of the season, contentious, fiery. Uh, obviously, the managers were going at it. They both, both managers got a red card, are going to serve a single game suspension. I don't know how I feel about that. Just to throw some thoughts about that out there. I kind of want my managers to be fired up a little bit. It's exactly like what we got with Wenger and Fergie. And at the end of the day, I want that. I want to know that the managers are invested. I want to know that they give a shit. I want to know that it's fiery. And both managers at the end of the game turned around and said, listen, it's just one of those things. We're both passionate. We both want to win. No big deal. If I saw him, it'd all be fine. You know, I want that. We need that. There's no Mourinho around. You know, it's like we, we need some per big personalities among the gaffers. Uh, and Tuchel and Conte certainly had that. So, listen, I didn't think it was a big drama. Uh, it was, you know, good to see. Uh, I like the way Conte absolutely outfed Tuchel, if I'm being honest about it. But it is what it is. So let's talk about the refereeing decisions. The refereeing uh, decisions were pretty shit for Chelsea. There's no getting away from it. They fucked up multiple times. I thought the ref, it was Mike Dean, I think. Uh, notorious fucking dog shit. Like, Chelsea definitely have a right to feel aggrieved that they didn't win this game. There was a foul in the build-up to a goal from Tottenham. And then right at the end, how you can't see that Kucherea gets his hair pulled, gets thrown to the ground. How people can't see that. How a ref here can't see that in his eye line. Even if you're unsure about it, 
Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, Mike Dean's obviously the head of the refs. He issued the apology. It was, yeah, you're right. It was, it was uh, Taylor, whatever. But the, the reality was, like, got it. If you're uncertain and you see a player go down and the ball's already out of play, just ask VAR. Ask your assistant ref, did anything happen there? Can we take a look at it? And that's what the VAR is for. It's meant to stop these, like, ridiculous things. And had, had he done that, had the ref done their job, and then gone over there and looked at that screen, you would have had probably, you would have had to have sent uh, somebody off and obviously a water free kick and they wouldn't have scored uh, the equaliser from the subs subsequent corner. So, uh, yeah, I saw that the Referees Association issued an apology. It always pisses me off because, you know, listen, it's a mad, mad world being a football manager and Tuchel, if he doesn't get results soon, he's going to find himself under pressure at a club like Chelsea. That's the nature of the beast. Uh, to get a two-all draw in a game that they should have won handily, massively frustrating uh, that, you know, in if that sense of grievance builds it can have like a lingering effect on a team so he's absolutely right he said today to Cal, like i don't know how to feel about this apology it pisses me off uh, i i never got on board with the respect campaign like even though i'm a, a rugby guy you know and there's, there's a saying in rugby the referee might be wrong but he's always the referee um they have all the punishments where it's like if you back if you bad mouth the referee they just give you yards for the infraction yards for the infraction until you give away a penalty try and it's really frowned upon if you're rude to the ref I fucking can't stand that these refs in the Premier League get to be as incompetent as this and there's never any consequences. It's super rare to see a referee get pulled off referee in a game or, you know, being sent down to the championship. And by the way, how's that a fucking punishment? All you're saying there is that, oh, you know, if you fuck up in the Prem, we'll send you to the championship. We'll send you down to the championship. Fuck the people in the championship, I guess. And so, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of like something that, I don't know, it really speaks ill of the football hierarchy and the football tiers. Just, I don't know. It just seems to me that there has to be accountability for referees. Yes, we can have respect. Yes, you don't want players putting hands on referees or getting around them or getting in their face. But referees get away with fucking murder week in and week out. There's no more excuses anymore. You've got VAR. You've got assistant refs. We can literally stop the game and look at a fucking video for almost every major in fraction and if you look at a fucking video and still can't get it right you shouldn't be a fucking referee so i'm far from a fucking chelsea fan hate those gammon guys but they actually had a fucking legitimate point about the referee and being disgusting here and you know tottenham they've rode their luck a little bit at the start of the season i still think they're going to be better than what they are and i still think chelsea are going to struggle they need a striker desperately they've got to convert these chances their midfield is going to dominate their defense is going to do reasonably well but they need to get ahead in these games uh when they are dominating next up let's talk about a circle jerk obviously in esports i've seen circle jerks i've seen some outrageous circle jerks i've talked about them i've done videos on like how overrated certain players are talking about you jks but this is football this is the premier league and let's just talk about this nottingham forest who've signed 100 fucking players uh this season and also just today it was officially announced they've paid a, to a deal that could be totally worth 43 million pounds for a fucking journeyman player from wolves more, I, I'm not even going to get into that. Can't be asked. But uh, they were able to beat uh, West Ham. So let's get into this, right? The circle jerk after this game, right, was that West Ham had fucked it, but Henderson, who you remember is at Forest, on loan, I believe, uh, from uh, United. Uh, Dean Henderson um, has performed incredibly well. He's like the, the fucking, you know, wow, what a time to prove his critics wrong. Wow, did you see how well he played compared to De Gea? Everyone was talking about Dean Henderson. Uh, there was even an article uh, written on the BBC, which, I'll uh, by the way, they churn out some shite. I blame Phil McNulty. But this was by Simon Stone. I think it was entitled, Henderson picks perfect time to back up bold statements. Now, let's be absolutely clear. This is a bullshit circle jerk that's got fuck all to do with reality. Here's what actually happened i think west ham hit the woodwork three times and two times dean henderson was absolutely rooted to the spot absolutely rooted to the spot one time including uh, a fucking shot that was on his near side he didn't even move at his near side and it's come in off the fucking cross section and nearly gone in and everyone's going like at the end of the game because he saved a fucking terrible penalty from declan rice oh look at Look at Dean Henderson. Compare him to De Gea. Dean Henderson didn't, like, he was 
almost irrelevant to why Nottingham Forest were able to win. There were a number of uh, defenders that I thought played fucking excellently. By the way, I talked about Nico Williams. He was uh, argu arguably Forrest's real man of the match. I talked about Nico Williams when they picked him up in my video and said I think he's going to be a good signing for them. He was excellent in that game, played his heart out and made a stellar contribution. Now, Forrest have used up half of their season's luck to get this result against West Ham. They really have. I mean, you're talking terrible defending for the goal from West Ham. I think there was a disallowed West Ham goal. They've hit the woodwork like three times. They've had a penalty from Declan Rice that you would have thought he was going to, you know, just bang in the net. And of course, he's done a back pass to Dean Henderson. Must have thought it was fucking, you know, England training or something. And at the end of the day, West Ham were the better team in this game uh, for me. They've still got problems. They're going to struggle to deliver on the promise of the finish. I think I had them fifth or sixth. And they're going to struggle to get there if this continues. Rice was not great. Obviously missed a penalty. But I mean, you know, he had some moments, but he didn't dominate the game. He didn't dominate the midfield, right? It was more Ben Rama and Fornals that seemed to be getting it done. And the real worry for me is Antonio... For the first 30 minutes, I didn't even know that motherfucker was on the pitch. Like, I was like, where? Like, oh, Antonio, he picked up a knock. I think they were saying he might be doubtful for the game. I thought, I just assumed he wasn't on. You didn't see him. Antonio, last season, was an absolute monster. He was so dominant, so strong on the ball, beating defenders, chasing down everything. For him to be anonymous is, like, really, really worrying. Now, Schumacher got his first goal for West Ham in European football last night or the night before. And as I said, they've got to get him up and running. He's the signing that I think, you know, uh, is going to add something to West Ham. But it is going to be a learning curve. And he came on as a sub in this game and didn't really change the game or do too much. Uh, but I was very impressed with Ben Rama, Fornals, Suchek. These players made a difference, and Ben Rama should have had maybe two goals. It could have just as easily been like that. But without Antonio, I don't know if West Ham can finish in the top six. I really don't at all. Like, they need him to start his season and soon. But... Back to the point why I included this. The Dean Henderson circle jerk was so out of pocket. There were so many other players deserving a recognition in that Forest team. And obviously, as I said, they used up a lot of luck. They were super reliant on like things that are just beyond your control, you know? A little inch here, a little inch there. West Ham win this game 3-1. It's like that. So keep an eye on West Ham because if they don't get their shit together soon, it could be an actual long season for them. And Declan Rice has got to do better than he did there. Oh, shit. I forgot to mention this. Phil McNulty, who I've already called out. Phil McNulty is the BBC's chief uh, uh, sports writer. He literally said after that two-all uh, game, he said that uh, they were a force to be reckoned with. Chelsea were a force to be reckoned with. Imagine it. Dominating play, only getting a two-all draw. Force to be reckoned with. I'll be checking in with Phil McNulty's bullshit over the course of this season. It's an absolute fucking joke. Then... This was super interesting. Did we had the fraud watch derby? Gerard Lampard head to head. Who was going to win? What was going to happen? Steven Gerrard obviously lost to Bournemouth on the opening day of the season. That wasn't a great start for him. Villa have spent money. Villa always spend money. But ever, this was the fraud derby. You know, lots of question marks around Gerard and is he actually going to be that good in the Prem? You know, this is going to be his first full season with Villa. They've spent money. They've brought in some signings. Gerard's had his opportunity to stamp his uh, identity on this team and the way he wants them to play football. And the suspicion has always been Gerard is just going to dine out on the fact he's a legendary figure and he's going to inspire uh, players. But if he can't get that and can't get them on board, what's really his football in philosophy? Those are the big questions. However, in this game, I thought Villa played really, really well. It certainly helped that they were playing against Everton. Everton are fucking terrible. I'm telling you, this team is relegated this season. They are the worst team I've seen play this season. Maybe with the exception of Man United. Man United aren't going to get relegated, guys. No matter how many wet dreams you have about it. Everton are the team that has looked absolutely terrible. And keep in mind, Everton have lost big-name players to injury. Lampard looks to be absolutely uh, clueless. And I am not feeling Everton 
to stay up at all they only seem to get their arse in gear towards the end uh this and, and villa had a real fucking go at throwing this game it was really crazy uh everybody had cramp in the sun early start to the season but in the end uh villa just had too much quality and were able to hold on there was some good you know late tackles from mings uh which you want to see ings uh had a good time up front the mings and ings connection i think buendia got man of the match in this uh and fair enough good start to his villa career for him getting this win looking decent uh and so look villa they still haven't fully convinced me i had them at the lower end of mid table i think right in the mix when i did my predictions everton for me have done absolutely nothing to suggest that they're not gonna go down i mean connor cody did all right actually i'll say that it will be had some moments but they just lack quality i think this is one of the worst squads overall in the prem i really think that it's hard to believe they're going to be able to stay up with this and honestly they look disorganized. They don't look good going forward. Definitely don't look good at the back. I've never been sold on Pickford. Don't think he's an inspiring presence. If you're a fucking uh, defender and you've got Pickford behind you, you're, it's always in the back of your mind. What's he going to do? And yeah, I stand by it. I still think the Everton pick for them to go down is super, super good value. So next up, Brentford Man United. How can we not talk about that? Now this was one of the biggest shocks you're gonna see uh but you know if you listen to me maybe it wouldn't be that much of a shock because that game underscored everything i said about man united this is the worst man united squad i've seen in my lifetime and the difference is now they don't even have that aura of being man united anymore no teams are intimidated by them you know no players are taking a pay cut to come well traffic anymore no players are you know biting their arm off to to come and play for them if adrian rabio is holding out on salary demands in, in, in saying yeah actually i can take or leave coming to united you've got a fucking problem like i don't even know how they're going to attract players like every result that happens like this is a step to absolute oblivion and this game it could have been worse it could have been worse you know i talked about the opening game of the season to brighton keep in mind they lost that and they could have had red cards in that game so they could have already been struggling for this squad brentford would just they just bullied united in this game i mean that's the word for it they played the style of play ironically that uh, ten Hag wants to play with united they pressed them high up the pitch famously de gea when he made that terrible pass they couldn't even get out their own box and it was just embarrassing it was absolutely embarrassing everybody was like laying it you know on the doorstep of De Gea said but it's not entirely his fault that's the reality it was not all his fault like his defense is that it's diabolical he has got nothing Maguire is shocking I do not understand how anybody can justify Maguire you know, Fred, shocking. Uh, Dallow, shocking. Sancho, like, man alive. Like, it's so sad to see Sancho in this state so early on in his development. All of the promise, the prospect of the player he could be compared to what you're getting delivered here. There's nothing up front. Like, McTominay, fucking sort it out. This was just an awful, awful performance. Probably, again, ericsson or ronaldo the best player for united and it just doesn't bode well at all for the season rashford having a chat uh with psg i don't see how they keep him if psg are seriously sniffing around one of the worst performances and made all the worst right keep this in mind uh united had two-thirds pos possession uh i think and lost the uh, lost four nil uh, just no quality, inability to defend from attack, just awful. They uh, have been linked with a number of players. A lot of moves have uh, crashed, but now Casemiro uh, looks to be coming in for 70 million. I don't know why Casemiro's coming. I really don't. It seems to me to be like such a weird move for him. But also, I guess, you know, Casemiro is, you know, 30 now. Probably his last big move. 
right where he can really get some money and man united is so desperate to get some big names in just to shut the fans up and forget about the embarrassment of being linked to like ornotovich and stuff like that but really like casemiro is like think about it you you play at madrid ch champions of europe and you're coming to United where you're going to be battling for mid-table mediocrity. I don't even think he's a Ten Hag style player. He's not going to press. He's not going to play in that high pressing style Ten Hag wants to have. So what's Ten Hag going to do now? Is he going to change his style? How's he going to fit into the lineup? It just feels like a fucking mess right now and the Casemiro move is all about the bag it's all about the bag it just doesn't feel like an ambitious move from his viewpoint beyond the financial uh, uh, rewards for doing so it, he's a big name I think he's a really good player obviously I don't know how he's gonna find playing it in this United lineup and I don't know I, I just don't know how he fits in with Ten Hag's football and philosophy at all honestly real bad stuff going on also I wanted to show you guys this the cancer within United stems from Maguire. It all stems from Maguire and everyone is protecting him. And this was all of Manchester United signings the guy rated. And I'm just going to bring up, right? Now they put them into green, amber and red, right? Now, we can just get the green out the way. You you can't disagree with Ibrahim. Ibrahimovic is never going to be a bad sign, right? So, fine. Uh, of course, it's fucking Zlatan. The absolute boss. Like, you know, the final boss of football. Yeah, of course. He did great. He always does great. He's a legend. When he went to Juventus, I think it was, I used to say to all my friends, ah, he's not that good. <laughs> he's not that good. He'll struggle. Uh, absolutely. Just one of the legends of the game. Still winning titles at fucking 40 years old. Uh, so, yeah, very much a green signing. Um, Bruno Fernandes, you know, listen, he's had a bit of a mare lately, but in terms of goals scored, big performances, yeah, he's been an immense player for United. Then you get into the amber here. This is ridiculous. So, putting Ronaldo in amber, I don't know how I feel about that, because obviously uh, this is in his return. He was like their top scorer. You know, I, I feel sorry for Ronaldo coming back to United. It should have been a very different outcome. It shouldn't have ended up the way it's ended up. And I've already told you, it's been reported in the press. Ronaldo thought he might get the armband because of his tenure at the club. And the fact he's a legend. And fucking Maguire insisted on it. This created a dressing room rift. And I just fucking despise Maguire. I despise him. He, he's an absolute liability as a footballer. He's just a tit. To put Ronaldo in amber after he came back at his age and was your top scoring player in a dysfunctional team feels a little bit harsh, especially from Gary Neville, someone who played with him the first uh, time around. Um, Cavani is amber. I thought Cavani actually should have been played more when he was at United. I think most of the fans feel that way. I think when Solskjaer gave him that run, he fucking actually had some big goals and big performances in big games. I feel like Cavani was criminally underused. He was absolute class almost every time he played. Scored some super memorable goals. Had loads of culture about... I mean, you think about where Rashford is now where I think it's like he hasn't scored in 16 games. You know, like having a Cavani to throw on for fucking 20 minutes at the end of a match, like Brentford, for fuck sake you know or maybe before it gets to four fucking nil or certainly bring him on for a half the squad would be better if he was still part of it even though i know he's getting on in years Maguire as amber is a fucking joke i cannot get my head around this i do not understand how he is in the amber block because this is your club captain this is the most expensive defender in the world more than van dyke you know and this this guy has been absolutely like he's played two premier league games this season and he has been dog shit he's been dog shit he's been responsible for the for goals got absolutely tortured by welbeck in the brighton game ten Hag wants to play a high line harry Maguire has the turning speed of a fucking like bendy bus in no pace you can't play a high line with him it's not going to work he's going to be playing people off sides 
all the fucking time. He is going to be playing people offside, onside, sorry, all of the time. He is terrible. He's terrible. He does it all the time. He's literally just, if you get in behind him and you time your run, he's never, he can't get, he can't turn to catch you. He's never catching you. You will always be having a shot. I saw a video on The Athletic about Harry Maguire. It was looking at his stats. His stoppages in 1v1 situations, i.e. how many dribbles he stops, is 50%. That is terrible for an elite level defender. That means every time someone runs at him, it is a coin toss as to whether or not he fucking be, like, tackles him. No matter who it is, it's an absolute joke. And I know there was uh, an appreciable improvement when Maguire came in at United, but his confidence is gone. The price tag's weighing him down. He's a fucking liability. He's created a rift in the dressing room. He wants to be the captain. He's a 90 million pound player when, he, when he's absolutely like, you know, that price tag is an absolute killer because you can't justify it in any way, shape or form. To put him in amber right now is mental. It is insane. The English player tax has just never been exemplified more than Harry Maguire everything about it the protection in the media it, it's absolutely shocking and i'll just add shaw being an amber i'm a shaw proponent i know people called me out last time wait but you said trent alexander arnold you said he was a bad defender and therefore it wasn't good enough for liverpool but luke Berto shaw lost bombing down the left wing you said that's a good thing i think he's better in the tackle than trent put it this way if you play in a back four with harry Maguire, like good luck to you power to you enjoy it Enjoy having one slow cunt play someone on side all the fucking time by not being in line with you. Yeah, enjoy it. It's fantastic, right? So I, I, Luke Shaw and Amber's fine for me. And then you've got Herrera and Matic in there. That's fine. Some of these reds, it's brutal. Pogba is a, a red? Come on, no chance. That's an outrage. Roy Keane fucking filled that in when Gary wasn't looking. That, you know, he's not a... Pogba wasn't a red signing. Don't tell me again. They wouldn't be better off with Pogba still there. I don't buy that for a second. He just didn't want to stick around. He just wanted to fuck off. Didn't they have like a 4-0, 5-0 victory? And Pogba had every assist. He'd already beaten like last season's assist total. Like He was a fucking cultured fucking midfielder. He's legit. One of the best distributors of the ball. <laughs> like, you know, which they're crying out for now. Because every time you watch McTominay try and deliver a pass, like, fuck me. It, you know... McTominay and Fred are your centre midfield, are they? Like, get me the fuck out. Get me out of the K-hole. This, this isn't Man United. So that was ridiculous to see him in the red. Oh, I also want to say, I made I made reference to Van Der Beek's heart problems last time. Van Der Beek doesn't have heart problems. Daily Blind had the heart problems. I got mixed up, didn't I? Because they're Dutch midfielders. So my bad. Apolog apologies to Donny. His heart's fine. He just doesn't get a game. He should get more minutes. He should get more games. You know, Martial in red. I mean, he had a good preseason. I thought he was going to start. I thought he was going to play more. I don't know why. Maybe he's a red signing. Fellaini is a red signing. Don't vibe with that either. Fellaini was a big game player for me. He definitely get Amber. I'm, uh, they, again, they miss a bit of Marouane. Some of these reds are outrageous. Maguire's and Amber's just an absolute shocker. Again, you're not helping anyone by defending this guy. He, he has got to go. You start fixing all the problems at United if you get rid of Harry Maguire. Just get rid of him. Just get rid of him. Play anybody else. It doesn't matter. It's going to be a nightmare anyway. Just, he, he's bottled it. He's gone. He's done. He literally said, by the way, in an interview that basically, listen, if I'm as bad as the fans say I am, why do I get picked? In the starting 11 every week. Have a fucking word with yourself, mate. You've got to come back down to fucking reality. It's ridiculous. Yeah, and Prime Matter in red is harsh as well, by the way. Matter, you weren't getting Prime Matter when you signed him. What do you expect? But I thought he was better than a red level quality player. Like, fuck me. Maguire's the problem. He's a captain with no accountability, literally thinks he's got a God-given right to be on the starting level. And I want Ten Hag to be firm. Listen, if the board are back in Ten Hag, right, if you're going to sign a 70 million player so he can get some results, maybe, or just keep the fans off his back, just back him, back his system, and back him to drop big names, clear out. You need It's another clearance. It's another clearance season, guys, at United. It really is going to be bad. You all bullied me into putting him seventh in the league. It... It might be 10th, like I'm telling you. Not to mention, Ronaldo's probably still out the door. The final talking point, obviously Liverpool 
uh, dropped points again. A lot of people uh, are already writing off Liverpool this season. I mean, guys, like, let's just clarify a few things. As I said, in the middle of this Premier League season, there is going to be a World Cup. Players are going to get injured. Liverpool and City, practically their entire squad, are going to be on duty. If City's key players get injured and Liverpool's don't, Liverpool suddenly have a massively increased chance of pulling away at the end. It's not like, unless they drop so many points, they're like, my City are out of sight by the time the World Cup runs around. Liverpool are in this for sure. Like, let's talk about the Palace game. They got a draw. Obviously, at home, Liverpool should beat Palace. I think we're all in agreement there. Now, there's some key factors. I just want to point out, Liverpool had 73% possession in this game. 73. And they generated 24 shots. And they only managed four on target. They were also at a massive disadvantage. And Darwin Nunes got himself sent off like a fucking idiot, right? He shouldn't have done, but he got himself sent off like an idiot. Like, you know, with over 30 minutes left on the clock. And they had to get dug out of a hole. And, they, and you know, thankfully, they were able to do it. Diaz's goal, by the way, one of the goals of the season so far, absolutely mental. And yeah, Nunez has already put out an apology on Twitter. But I'll just tell you, like, you, you can't have that kind of temperament. You're not going to get away with that in the Prem. Fair enough. Like, Crystal Palace knew he could be wound up, knew he, he was fiery, knew he'd react, knew he'd get frustrated. And that's part of the game, too. I don't even hate that. I saw people threatening uh, Anderson uh, after the match. And no, he's done his job there as a defender. If you wind up a player and get them fucking sent off, that's great. That's great for your team. You know, it's, is it is it sporting? No, it's not. Who gives a fuck? At the end of the day, when Palace are away at Anfield, they got to do what they got to do. They got to dig deep and use every little trick in the book they can to get a result. And Nunes, the idiot, served it up on a plate. Now, in my mind, there is no doubt had Nunes stayed on, I think Liverpool would have won this game. That contextually says to me, this is like one of these things. It's a learning curve. Nunes is their big star player. Salah, uncharacteristic. He missed some, you know, sitters in this. And overall, you know, for them to carve out a draw when they've got 10 men at home with their star striker sent off 30 minutes to, to go. Look, I still feel good about my pick for Liverpool winning the title this season. Yes, th their squad isn't as robust or as strong as Man City's. Obviously, Man City has an embarrassment of riches. Liverpool's is definitely susceptible to injuries should they get one or two across the season. But I also feel, you know, like they had a really long season last season. They were always going to come in with a bit of uh, a few wobbles and a few mistakes. And head to head, when I've seen them play City, they look lights out against City. And obviously we had the you know, Charity Shield uh, as well, where Liverpool were able to beat City. Um, so look, don't write them off yet. Don't write Liverpool off yet. I know they've dropped four points in two games right at the start of the season. First 10 games don't mean shit. Like, it's all over the place. Like, United are not going to be rock bottom after 10 games. Liverpool aren't going to be mid-table after 10 games. Uh, City probably are going to be top after 10 games. Uh, that's just how it is. But overall as well, I want to give some credit to, like, uh, Patrick Vieira. Like, not a lot of people have talked about Patrick Vieira since he took over as, like, gaffer at Crystal Palace. I know that, like, yeah, Crystal Palace are kind of like one of those teams where you just don't really want to talk about them. They feel like mid-table mediocrity personified. But I honestly think, like, Patrick Vieira's done good. I think he's, like, you know, reinvigorated, like, Zaha. I think he's made some decent signings. I think Palace are always, like, a competitive team. They never feel like they're going to be a pushover. And I love Patrick Vieira, you know, as a player. Credit to him. Credit to him for grinding out a draw in very difficult circumstances. Get your first point of the board on uh, on early. And yeah, Eze, of course, in there as well. Fantastic to watch. So good value for the draw, Palace. They came with a game plan. They were battered. But uh, you've got to put away your chances. All the things are said about Chelsea. True of Liverpool. You expect them to be clinical. And obviously Nunes didn't help uh, with that. There was actually, um, you know, an interesting uh, thing that Klopp said after the game. I can't be disappointed with the result. But I am proud of the performance. This was a proper Liverpool game. The way we started and put them under uh, under pressure. Palace had an idea. They sat deep and they looked for counter-attacks. And therefore it was really uncomfortable to play against them. Especially with their speed, quality and technique. I don't know how many shots they were able to block. So yes. So look, he he's aware of the fact that they need to be a bit more clinical. But not everyone is going to be able to defend as well uh, as Palace did for as long as they did. 
did against Liverpool. Liverpool aren't going to have Nunes sent off every game. Salah's not going to be that quiet uh, every game. So listen, I think it's going to be. I think I think it's going to be fine. They got injuries to come uh, to come back. Liverpool. It's all going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Huff that copium if you're a Liverpool fan. It's going to be all right. Those are the talking points uh, from the Premier League, and uh, I'll keep doing one of these once a week, along with all the other stuff.